this quick presentation, an abridged presentation, I will be discussing uh, 3D printing a Mariner's Astrolab and a review on how it was used. Um, for those of you that seen this uh, presentation before, this, this is, as I mentioned, the bridge, just a shorter version. Um, the simplified Mariner's Astrolab, of which two versions are shown here, was used for navigation only, and originally could only be used to determine latitude north or south of the equator by sighting stars. To make my Mariner's Astrolab, I first created a 3D model, which you can see here. Um, this is my finished 3D model, what it looks like, front and back view. I used the free hobbyist version of Fusion 360 to create the model. As my printed version has virtually no weight to it, I created a pocket in the lower back for coins to act as ballast to help the body to hang properly. So this area right here was the pocket for the coin. This is my JG Aurora 3D printer. The right side image shows the body being printed. I created an STL file from my model, then generated the G code or toolpath for the printer nozzle to follow using the free Ultimaker Cura program downloaded from the internet. I used a PLA and wood blended filament because it's easily sanded. The PLA part is a cornstarch product that is fully biodegradable. My complete material cost was about three pounds and 31 pence and weighs 173 grams or about one third of a pound. Here is the backside of the body, the open printed area or lines above the coin pocket and the crown at the top are called support. So that would be this grid here and this grid down here. They're called supports. They allow the printer nozzle to print in midair by providing a support or bridge for the layer of hot filament to be deposited over. The lower image on the right is after cleanup. The ballast in the cavity is 15 Canadian one cent coins. So near their ballast down here. These are the finished and cleaned up parts. I adorned my ballast base with the print year 2022 in Roman numerals and two star maps. The little dipper with Polaris at its tail that locates the North Pole, which would be right there. And this is the little dipper. And the Southern Cross and ancillary stars used to locate the South Pole. So there's the Southern Cross and the other stars, three of them. I'll be talking about Polaris in a bit, but to find the South Pole, you extend an imaginary line, as you see here, between the two pointer stars, then extend another from the midpoint to Achnar which is the further star. Then extend an imaginary line across the two of the five stars of the Southern Cross. So across these, so you see four stars here. The fifth star is actually right about where my pointer is, very small. It's actually three stars, almost one on top of the other. So where they intersect right here is, almost exactly above the celestial silk pole, which would be just below it. And that's how you find the silk pole in the other hemisphere. So I completed the look of my 3D printed Astrolab with a brushed on King Art bronze metallic acrylic paint. These were purchased through Amazon. Here's my finished working Mariner's Astrolab. When sighting the sun, you do not look directly at it because at the sun because you can get you can go blind. To use the astrolab, they say to hold one hand behind the sights, as I'm doing in the image, to witness the light beam shining through them, as seen here. I found that the alidad or the pointer could be adjusted so you could witness the alignment to the rear sighting hole without a hand being held behind it. The sun shines through the forward sighting hole onto the rear plate 
and you continue to turn the aladad or pointer until it lined up with the rear sighting hole. No need to actually hold your hand behind it. So here's the one sighting hole in the forward plate. Here's about where the second sighting hole is. And you can see the sunbeam on it because as the sun shines on this plate, it casts a shadow on that one. So it's easy to see that light beam. So you don't actually have to hold your hand and watch for the beam back here. And then you read the angle off of the scale here. Now that I have an astrolabe and know how to use it, how do I determine my latitude, north or south of the equator? To use the last astrolabe during the day and find your latitude north or south of the equator, you must first identify solar noon for your location. Solar noon is when the sun has reached its highest point in the sky. This can be done by simply standing a stick straight up in the ground and mapping its shadow until it's at its shortest length. The shortest length should be practically due north of the stick if using a compass to identify magnetic north. I used a sundial to identify my solar noon. When the sun has reached its highest point and shadows are at their shortest length, you read the elevation or angle of the sun above the horizon with your astrolabe, this angle here. This angle is subtracted from 90 degrees, the location of the sun at the equator at solar noon. So the sun would be here if you were at the equator, but because of where I am, the sun is over here. So I subtract this angle from 90 to get the difference. The last thing we need to do is to make a correction for the, for the declination or tilt of the earth towards or away from the sun. The Earth has a constant tilt or declination angle of 23.45 degrees at the poles, but the relationship of this angle to the sun changes as the Earth rotates around the sun, resulting in our four seasons, as we lean closer to or further away from the sun. Our orbit is not the perfect circle depicted here. This is a slightly more accurate depiction of our orbit around the sun with the perfect circle orbit referenced in dashed lines. The shape is more elliptical or egg-shaped than circular and our orbit is off-center. You can see the distance between the four quadrants of our orbit are not equal. This makes it difficult to interpolate the presented angle to the sun at any specific day in any given quadrant. The data needed to identify the tilt on any given day was pre-calculated and early navigators and explorers had published reference tables. Today, we can easily access this information on the internet. Here is the declination table for the year 2022. You can see that on the 6th of August, the angle of declination was a positive 16.5633 degrees. We add or subtract the declination correction from our earlier calculation, and that reveals our latitude, north or south of the equator. You need a new table for each year because the angle shifts a little bit every year until it resets with the correction of an extra day in the leap year. I'll explain this in a moment. In our northern hemisphere, if using the astrolabe at dusk, when we can still see and read the angle off our astrolab, we would simply locate Polaris, the North Star, and read its elevation above the horizon as it is practically over the North Pole. Its elevation is a direct indication of latitude. There's no corrections, no need to subtract it from 90 degrees or anything like that. You just, whatever that angle is that you read, that's your latitude. Now that we've determined our latitude, how do we determine longitude, east or west of the prime meridian? Today, we simply note the time difference between solar noon at our location and that of Greenwich, England, the prime meridian. It wasn't until 1760 that an accurate mariner's clock was invented to achieve this. The clock was set to universal time, or UT, once known as Greenwich Mean Time, or GMT, 
we would deduce the difference between our location's solar noon and that of the prime meridian, which is shown here to be plus five hours and 23 minutes. So the difference between Greenwich or the prime meridian and where I'm located is five hours and 23 minutes. Knowing the Earth rotates 15 degrees every hour, we multiply the two and almost have our longitude position west of the prime meridian. We need to make one correction for solar time. We say there are 24 hours in a day, but this is actually an average. Two days in November are 16 minutes and 23 seconds longer, while February is one day and 14 minutes. One day is 14 minutes and 20 seconds shorter. This is due to the off-center elliptical orbit of the Earth around the sun and the effect of the strength of the magnetic pole between the two, causing the Earth's rotational speed to vary, resulting in one extra day every four years. This results in the need for the leap year, adding a date in February to correct the time to our nominal 24 hours a day. This table lists the correction for solar time in 2022. And we can see that on the 6th of August, 2022, solar mean time was slow by minus five minutes and 53 seconds. We make a correction to our time by subtracting five minutes and 53 seconds from the original five hours and 23 minutes, giving us almost five hours and 17 minutes. Multiply this by the 15 degrees per hour rotational speed of the Earth reveals our latitude west of the prime meridian. It's worth noting once again that all of this data you see on the table shifts a little every year until it resets with the extra day found in the leap year. So how did navigators and explorers determine latitude before an accurate timepiece was available in 1760? They would locate themselves by sighting the elevation of a known star above the horizon, normally at dusk when you could see the horizon and make a note of the time and angle. They would then refer to a book of tables that told them where on the globe and exactly when the star could be seen directly overhead. They would have to make corrections for the Earth spinning 15 degrees per hour to correct its location for the time of day they sighted it. With trigonometry, they could calculate the distance they were from that spot by knowing two things, the angle of elevation of the star and the distance of one side of a right angle triangle. As they didn't know the distance of the star, they would flip the triangle and use the distance from the surface of the Earth to its center, the mean radius, had been calculated to be 6,731 kilometers or 4,182 and a half miles in the year 430 BCE before the Common Era. Using trigonometry, they simply rearranged the formula to calculate their distance. So they know the angle and they know this distance so they can calculate how far they are from where that star is directly overhead. The problem now is that this calculated distance puts them somewhere on a radius. They don't know the exact spot on the radius, and this is what they are trying to figure out. So they would take a second and maybe a third reading off other known stars and calculate the radial distance from the direct overhead location of those stars. The intersecting point was their location. They called this getting a fix. So they would plot this location from their last known or calculated location on a flat map to see where they were. They could also estimate their position throughout the day by taking a noon reading and finding their latitude or using this in conjunction with their compass heading and a log speed reading. And this was how it was done. And that concludes my presentation.